1965, a young lawyer named Ralph Nader published a book titled Unsafe at Any Speed, which was a harsh critique of automotive safety. One chapter of the book was dedicated to the curious handling of the Chevy Corvair. Nader called it the one car accident. So I've arranged to drive a Corvair, and not just any Corvair, but one owned by Ralph Nader himself. I've rented a wide open runway, and I'm here to find out, essentially, will the Corvair kill me? The Corvair is the most controversial car in history. I've always been fascinated with it, so I put together the pieces to draw my own conclusion. It was designed in the 50s, during a time when the average American car lumbered down the road carrying two tons of steel and rubber, and the post-war exuberance was still in full swing. And with a price of less than 2,000 bucks, it was cheap, and it provided families with an alternative form of transportation. At the time, General Motors sold roughly half of the new cars bought each year, so it was flush with cash and it used those resources to rethink the automobile. Now, unlike every other American car that carried a water-cooled engine in front, the Corvair's engine resided in the trunk. And since the engine was cooled by a fan, it didn't need a radiator. The goal was simplicity and function over form. Chevy had big plans for the car. In Nader's book, he called the Corvair the one-car accident. He wrote that a design flaw in the rear suspension made the car likely to flip over when driven in abrupt maneuvers, like say, avoiding a ball that suddenly rolled into the street. The book was a bestseller and has been linked to the Corvair ever since. For Ralph Nader, it was very successful, yes. Say hello to Peter Kaler. Now I love listening to Kaler. He's obviously so emotionally invested in the car when you hear him talk about Nader, there's almost a little tinge of anger in his voice. He presented the work in a fashion that sold books and got people's attention. I think that's probably the best way to put it, okay? Pete's a former GM engineer and a Corvair fanatic. I've got 15 Corvairs, I believe. We're supposed to be a group of rugged individuals. But we have Corvairs because they're different. They're not Camaros, they're not Impalas, they're not Corvettes but I want to be unique in a unique group of people. I've always wondered if Nader's claims were fair. In car circles, Nader is credited with effectively killing Chevy's small car. Brock Yates, the longtime car and driver columnist, regularly vilified Nader. Yates lumped Nader into a group he referred to as the safety Nazis. Now to me, a car-obsessed adolescent born five years after Nader's famous book, Yates' diatribes and stunts were gospel. Nader's book helped usher in a host of emissions and safety regulations that hobbled vehicle performance. When I finally got around to actually reading Nader's book in the 1990s, however, the car companies had long since engineered around the regulations. Horsepower was back and climbing. The death rate since 1965 had dramatically dropped, and our cars are now far safer and cleaner. This is a 1962 Monza four-door sedan that I purchased from Ralph Nader. Having Ralph Nader's Corvair, trying to get the story out that this is still a viable vehicle. It's a hobby, we enjoy it. I haven't been killed yet. Uh, I don't have any grass stains on the roof of my Corvairs. It's not as unsafe, perhaps, as the book made it look. So I bought it. The first lawsuit arrived in 1961. Now GM's lawyers wanted to settle, but Ed Cole, who was credited with designing the car, and Frank Winchell, GM's head of R&D, convinced GM's board to fight. So GM enlisted the entire research and development department to prepare a defense. Their rationale was it's an easy case to try because it's different. Our feeling was making things different is what we do as engineers. <laughs> so we didn't find anything bad about that at all. This is retired Chevrolet engineer Jim Musser. He spent his career in the research and development department at GM, and he worked on improving the Corvair and preparing the defense for the court cases. No one knows the Corvair better than Jim. The claim against the Corvair was it was defective design. 
So that meant two things. One is that every Corvair was defective. And two, it was a slight on General Motors engineering that they would engineer a defective car. We felt it had to be vigorously defended, which we did. The Corvair doesn't automatically roll over and die. The Corvair doesn't cause you to be a bad driver. If you know what you're doing, you can drive the Corvair. If you know what you're doing, you can drive a Volkswagen Beetle or a 356 Porsche, which all had the same suspension system that Ralph said was unsafe at any speed. That really isn't true. The problem was too much weight transfer at the rear for two reasons. One, swing axle has a high roll center, which contributes to weight transfer. Because of the weight back there, the coil springs were stiffer. And so that added to the roll stiffness as well. So fully 80% of the weight transfer and cornering was on the rear tires. And that's what caused it to, to un oversteer and eventually go out of control. Okay, what these guys are trying to say is that the Corvair wasn't flawed as much as it was designed with a unique purpose, and that was economy. Its rear suspension was simple, so it could be made cheaper, and consequently it sold for less than $2,000. The idea here was a family car. They were entered in the mobile gas economy runs back then. They got over 30 miles to the gallon. They, they won their class several years. That's, that's how Ed Cole envisioned the car. Just a bread and butter, get to the grocery store and back, economical, cheap to buy, cheap to maintain kind of a car. The way it's operated uh, is different from any other car, and if you don't know the differences, you could cause yourself to be in a situation that's hard to recover from. Now, is that the fault of the engineer? Was that the fault of the company that, in, that built the car and sold it? Or is that just somebody forgot to follow the rules? Now before you call me reckless, you should know a few things. I've been racing and testing cars for over 20 years. I've been to numerous racing schools, driving is my life, and while I'm not a professional race car driver, I know what I'm doing behind the wheel. I've also rented the perfect facility for these maneuvers. It's an airport with hugely wide runways, nothing to hit, and plenty of runoff. I've known Larry for a while. I trust his ability to drive. My major thing is Larry knows how to go fast and Larry knows when to say whoa. But even still, I'm nervous. I start slowly. I turn the wheel. I'm unsure what's going to happen. In the back of my mind is that crash footage that's all over YouTube that shows the thing spinning out and rolling. I don't know how strong this roof is, but it's nowhere near as stout as the roofs on today's cars. I've got a helmet, I've got a lap belt, but I've also got three kids at home. The way cars can be rolled easily, many cars can be rolled easily, is to make a hard turn in one direction to get the body to roll as far as it will go and then suddenly turn it in the opposite direction to add momentum to that roll. As I start picking up speed, cutting the wheel back and forth, I can feel the rear end get light. When you're racing, a car that oversteers like this is a huge benefit. You can use both ends of the car to navigate turns quicker than you would otherwise. I like it. It's fun. The swings get wider. They happen more abruptly. It doesn't feel like it's catching. It feels like it's gradual, almost graceful in its moves. But again, I've got a perfect situation here. A perfectly maintained car. The car does what it is designed to do. And the question is, is that worse than the alternative? Say another driver does the same thing in a 1960 Chevrolet Impala. Now the Impala probably wouldn't spin, but instead it wouldn't make the turn at all. Now since every situation is unique, it's impossible to say which outcome is preferable. Between the two, however, the Corvair probably has the better chance of avoiding that ball that rolled into the street. I think of the Corvair as a sacrificial lamb that motivated Nader to write a book that got the industry to make some initially painful changes that ultimately proved necessary. Every car has a story. The Corvairs just happens to be more interesting than most.